here, I'll rely on all of you who've read the book to pick it up and, and carry it there. It's my intention um, at the end of, uh, I'm, I'm going to be asking you, uh, those of you who are interested in doing it, to, uh, to write some of your reactions or concerns, and particularly this one, Hugh. You know, would Carter have the same, are you all hearing me because I'm not yeah. like yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, would yeah. Carter yeah. have the same principles today as he did 23 years ago? Uh, I thought at the end of this that I would try to communicate with him and to and, and send him our concerns and questions. The biggest to me is since the whole world and particularly our country is so uh, concerned about civility right now, what's he doing about it? Is there an update to the book? Are there things that he would want to say now that, that, that have come up in these 23 years since he wrote the book? So I would like for us to send our collective questions to him to see if we'll get an answer. We might not, but one thing I learned from Stetson Kennedy, Stetson never hesitated a moment to communicate with the highest person in authority, whether he expected they would respond to him or not. And more often than not, they did. And, and so, so, I, uh, so write down those questions and let's, and let's uh, uh, plan on, on asking Carter that same question. That is an awesome, that is awesome idea. Yeah. Okay, are we ready to launch? Yes, I think we should. Okay, I think it might be helpful to tell you a little bit about Carter first. Those of you that have the book have the information about him on the back, but his background is really interesting. Uh, Stephen Carter was born in Washington, D.C. His mother was, a, um, was a, a, an attorney uh, and his, uh, he was, she was the executive assistant to Julian Bond. Um, his father was the director of the, of the Urban League in Jacksonville. Uh, and in his teenage years, his growing up years were in Washington, D.C., early on in a black ghetto uh, and, or, and then in a white neighborhood, which he talks about in the book. And then his father was made vice, vice chairman or vice president of Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. So his teenage years were spent in Ithaca. He comes from a long line of black activists. <coughs> he was the first black district attorney in the state of New York. So think about, he's our age. He was born in, uh, in uh, what, 1954. And so think about what, how, what age, in what age his grandmother would have lived. And yet she was an, a district attorney already. Uh, he uh, got graduated from uh, Stanford, uh, and then he went on to Yale, where he was editor of the Yale Review. Uh, and he is now a, he was a law clerk for Thurgood Marshall. So he has uh, been around some, some very important people in his lifetime. Uh, and it might interest you to know that, uh, of course, he, he is at Yale now. Uh, and his wife uh, attends St. Luke's Episcopal oh. Church, which is one of the oldest predominantly black Episcopal church, churches in the country. So I think he would be, it would be interesting to him to know that the people of St. Cyprian's have been uh, pondering his book to the extent that we're going to this morning. Can I send out the 14 points to you, the, the one page sheet that kind of looks like that, that came from the church office. Uh, these were not my ideas. He italicized each chapter. So in case we failed to get the point, he made sure that we would. And so these are the 14 points that he italicized in the book. And so when we started to, when we were considering uh, uh, reviewing this book, uh, I mentioned to you that I didn't think all the chapters were worth the attention that we were giving to each of the chapters and pondering it the way we did, and if it takes all summer. The last four of them do not have 
in my judgment, the same power and, um, and challenge that the rest of the book has. And so don't worry if it looks like in these two days that were two sessions that we're discussing the book, that we're not going to get through it because I, we're not going to deal that much, just the nuggets out of those four chapters. So I invite all of you who have the book that say, whoa, Sandra, there are this and these four chapters are things I think we ought to think about. So, um, uh, so if we give them short shift here, I'll have to rely on the rest of you to, to, to pick that up for us. Uh, <clears throat> Let me see again how many people have the book or, and have read the book at this point. So we, we've got, okay, well, good. Then, then everything I'm going to say is not going to be redundant. Excuse me. Yeah. Can I just interrupt? Someone has their um, mic on very, very high volume, and we can hear papers moving around. If you would, uh, we would let's that, all just mute is that out. Me? Is that me? I don't know. Try moving something around. I was moving paper around, so it might be me. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I just think everyone should mute except the speaker. Right. Oh. Yeah. And, and because people are muting, I have asked Mary Beth if she will be our moderator for pause and ponder. Uh, when we're reading and we're hearing or reading something that is, is meaningful, we often want to read it a second time or we want to pause and ponder it. So the pause and ponder sign is this. So at any point, if you want to pause and ponder, or if you want me to, to reread uh, re a, a section of it that I'm, I'm presenting to you or to, um, or, or to make a comment, please do that. That's welcome. This is, please let's not make this a lecture. But I'm gonna be so focused on the material, I might not see it. So Mary Beth will sing out if she sees the pause and ponder sign and don't be the least shy about using it. It's, it's important for all of us uh, to, uh, in, in, our, in our life together and in understanding the material to pause and ponder whenever you feel like you need to. All right, well, Carter opens the book with an example from the 19th century in which people were beginning to take uh, uh, train rides uh, across the United States. And while first class could go in comfort, in third and fourth class, people were literally packed in like sardines, shoulder to shoulder on wooden benches for a ride across the United States. And so uh, a railroad official named Isaac Peoples produced a document, a, a literally a, a pamphlet, that were the manners for how to make this very uncomfortable and long journey manageable, tolerable for the people that were going to do it. And it contains just things like you shouldn't sing, and shouldn't talk too loud, you weren't supposed to stare at people. It, these looked like manners, uh, manners, but they were little things that people were asked to give up certain impulses to make the journey tolerable for the group. And that basically is the metaphor that, uh, that uh, Carter uses for, for this, uh, the notion of civility, that there are two aspects of civility that are important. One, that we sacrifice, and in most cases, he's talking about minor behaviors or, or, um, uh, or, 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 or actions um, for the set, for the, for the, to, to, to make it for, for others. And the second is, we, we, know, we care enough about community to make it all tolerable so that we can all do what we have to do in a democratic society. So he, he did point out, which I find really interesting, that uh, in 1997, that was the year before he wrote the book, that there was a study by the Onenberg School of Communication that said that Congress was less civil than it had been since 1935. Dear heaven, what would the man be saying today? Now, I really invite you to listen to these principles with maybe two, two tracks of thought. One has to do with what we learned 
in if it, when it takes all summer. One of the reasons that I suggested this book on the heel of our discussion of that is that not only does he deal with the Martin Luther King's demonstrations and the principle behind it, but that, um, that the, uh, this book adds insight to It Takes All Summer and It Takes All Summer provides a background to see the civility of the people who are demonstrating here in a different light. So kind of keep, if it takes all summer in mind. And the second is what we're dealing with today. And I, uh, the, I, I couldn't read civility without thinking about masks. Masks, a simple act, sacrificing a portion of our personal liberty for the well-being of the community. Now, Wood Carter, and I, I hope that you all will chime in at some point at, at the end of our conversation today or next week. And, you know, what would Carter say about wearing a mask? So keep those two tracks kind of in mind as we explore this together. So according to Carter, civility is the sum of the many sacrifices we are called upon to make for living together. When we pretend that we travel alone, and Carter cites a book called Bowling Alone, which talks about how our society since World War II has been, become decreasingly, increasingly individualistic in which people don't bowl on teams, they don't join civic clubs, they don't feel themselves a part of and, and take on a responsibility for the community. So it, we, uh, when we pretend that we travel alone, we can also pretend that these sacrifices are unnecessary. Yielding to this very human instinct for self-seeking, I shall argue it is often immoral and certainly should not be done without forethought. We should make sacrifices for others, not because doing so makes social life easier, although it does, but as a signal of respect to our fellow citizens, marking them as full equals, both before the law and before God. Rules of civility are thus also rules of morality. It is morally proper to treat our fellow citizens with respect and, immor and morally improper not to do so. Now I'm moving for those of you that are, have the book, I'm moving a bit to page, to page 18. The purpose of this book is to defend the ideal of civility and to propose a path toward restoring it to its vital status as a central feature of our republic. As we prepare to enter a new century, God help us, that was 23, 20 years ago, the role of student of civility is not a call for a return to a mythical golden age, but to press for a reconstructed civility. Now that's an, I'm, I'm going to do a pause and ponder there. A reconstructed civility. What would a reconstructed civility look like? What would a reconstructed civility take for us to bring it about? So he presses for a reconstructed civility that preserves the highest and best of our traditions of acceptable behavior, demands of us that we rein in our desires, and yet at the same time, avoid the repressive results. And he's referring here to Jim Crow, he's referring here to racism and its many forms because he does delve into those, those issues at some point. But yet at the same time avoids the repressive results of our traditions at their worst. 
Now, does anybody want to take a kind of pause and ponder point here? Yeah, I do. Uh, um, I, I wonder, uh, I've read the book and I've listened to your lecture at the UU Church in, in, um, in St. Augustine. And I, I wonder now when I look at um, policemen having their knees on black um, people who are dying, their mothers, their sisters, their, their community. Um, I wonder how easy civility is for those people, or even if it's a fair expectation. This is a good point. You know, how, when Stetson used to say, these are, this is his quote, don't murmur to me about brotherhood until you take your foot off my neck. I think that's your point. And uh, then I think the challenge, as I see it, uh, let, me, let me ask the rest of you to respond to that. What, what about this issue of, you know, of don't murmur to me about brotherhood until you, or about civility until you take your foot off my neck? How could civility play a role in, I think we would agree the that, that George Floyd was not in a position of civility. The cops definitely were, were, were committing the ultimate act of incivility, which was murder. But, yes, Tom. I, was, I wanted to comment on number, uh, I think it was number three on your listing. Mm -hmm. And I think this fits into what you're talking about. Uh, civility has two parts, generosity, even when it is costly, and trust, even when there is a risk. And right now, I'm going farther and farther away from trust in this area of alternative facts and lying and, uh, uh, you know, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't have more civility and less trust. Now, uh, the black community, they don't even, they, many, I shouldn't make a, a generalization, they don't trust that the vaccine is in their best interest. We're still back in the Tuskegee days and uh, they have, they don't trust the uh, uh, legal system. You know, they don't trust the uh, health system. They don't trust white America, if you will. And uh, my, my only issue on that is I, I'm not seeing a whole lot of, should I say, non-civility coming out of the black community. You know? The, the, the okay. non-civility is coming out of the white community, but the lack of trust is, in, is, is justifiably in, in the black community. To make our group conversation more meaningful, we have two points here that are worth extending perhaps after these two days are over. Uh, the first is the first one that was made in the case of, of uh, an action like that against, uh, against Floyd. Uh, where is the role of civility when faced with issues like police brutality? And secondly, how do we develop trust in, uh, in, in situations that are distrustful of both information and each other. So let, let's signal those two things. And, and Mary Beth, if you'll be with us to, to keep our ponder points so that perhaps something meaningful and something both personally and collectively meaningful might come out of this. Any other um, your thoughts about this notion of these, these, these two principles of, uh, of, of uh, civility as the sacrifices, the small sacrifices that each of us make. Uh, I see a hand down here. George? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I think we've seen civility in many people in the black community as they have forgiven the people that have been their assailants. I think of the uh, church in, was it Charleston, where that young man came in and killed so many people. And yet 
there was forgiveness there. And I think of, well, the Amish school years ago where the Amish forgave the person who shot so many of their children and killed them. I think we've seen forgiveness on the part of uh, the African-American community many, many times. Uh, and I would You just froze up, Sandra. Nothing she can do about it. Here you are. Got my time mixed up. Okay. Hi, Barb. I was thinking 1130. God, I'm all out of sync. Anyway, I was down on my hands and knees wiping up my kitchen floor. <laughs> Welcome, sweetheart. Okay. Nice to see you so all. So uh, uh, I was saying that we remember the reconciliation ceremony that was held at the invited all the African American had arrested to come and shake their hands and seek their forgiveness. And they came and we did. And it was uh, so remarkable that I got emails from friends saying that uh, the press reported it in Sweden because it happens so seldom anybody asks for forgiveness and reconciliation. But if we may move on to, to the last principle. Um, and then we're going to get to the point that was made earlier about, um, uh, about this uh, point number three, because that is the very heart of what happened in St. Augustine and I think is so significant. Yes, we see a Pause and ponder. Can't hear you. Okay. We seem to be uh, agreeing between us that civility is somehow a loss of personal freedom. And somehow we are saying, but not really saying, that this is regrettable, but it is for the greater good. I would say that... Uh, Civility, in fact, benefits all of us and gives us freedom and not a loss of freedom because civility brings us stability. And without stability, we have no freedom. Civility gives us stability. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. I think the author would say that too. I think, yes, he would agree with that. Then he goes on to say, you know, civility, as we've seen, is a set of sacrifices we make for the sake of our common journey with others. And that there are others. There are others. When we are civil, we are not pretending to like those who we actually despise. We are not pretending to hold any attitude toward them that we accept and value them as every bit our equals before God. A lot of people, but that's that's the challenge that he's that Carter is suggesting to us. The duty to love our neighbors is a precept of both Christian and Jewish tradition, and that lesson. That duty is not lessened because we happen to think that our neighbor is wrong about things. That's the point that Hugh was referring to earlier. That's hard. Really hard. When we, uh, at the end of this two days together, if it's of interest to you, I will share with you my personal challenges and sometimes my failures in trying to live by these principles. Also, the two communities in which I lived in which these principles were the way things had to be done. Um, so, hmm. comment. Our duty to love our neighbors is a precept of both the Christian and Jewish tradition. And that duty is not lessened because we happen to think our neighbor is wrong about a few things. 
So, principle about our duty, whether our neighbor, whether we like our neighbors or not, is referenced by him in conversations about the two points that he makes here about Dr. King and civility. On page 24, he uses the demonstrations that Dr. King led as an example. Consider the mass protest rights movement. The true junior, genius of Martin Luther King was not in his ability. Many other preachers did so with as much passion and as much power, but in his ability to inspire in those very people to be loving and civil. Love and civility as a strategy for social change. Democracy demands dialogue and dialogue flows. I'm sorry, I need to go back, I skipped. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read that last sentence again so that these thoughts uh, uh, make sense. The true genius of Martin Luther King was not in his ability to articulate the preachers did so with as much passion and power, but in his ability to inspire those very people to be loving and civil in their descent. This is not the antithesis of, hypocr of hypocrisy. It is an act of high principle. The civil rights movement wanted to expand American democracy, not destroy it. And King understood civil dialogue serves no democratic function. Democracy demands dialogue from disagreement. But we can and maybe must be re relentlessly partisan without being actively in civil. Like, what does that mean? Indeed, the more passionate our certainty that we are right, the more urgent our need to practice the art of civility. Otherwise, we make dialogue impossible and the possibility of dialogue is the reason democracy values disagreement in the first place. Rights marchers threatened with fire hoses, police dogs, terrorist bombs, and assassins' bullets could be civil in their dissent against a system willing and ready to destroy them. It is laughable to suggest that the rest of us far seeing, facing far less trepidations lack that capacity. Believe in dialogue then, hypocrisy lies not in the pretense that we can discuss our aid of civility. May we take a few moments to, um, to, to ponder together his take on that and how it played out in, in what we remember in St. Augustine or anything else you want to say about the civil rights movement and civility as a strategy. They had training, extensive training. Uh, there is a group here that is doing something called living room conversations. Mm -hmm. And there's training involved in that and practice. So I've been through the training and now we're gonna have our first practice session. So it doesn't come naturally. Um, it, uh, for me, it doesn't come naturally. I have to make a conscious decision and then learn how to do that. Yes, there, I, I see that too. There's there's a whole element, especially when you're talking about respecting people that you disagree with. The whole element of emotional intelligence. Yeah. 
It's not natural for some of us at all. <laughs> the training that, uh, that was offered to people in SCLC was a good bit more intense that we're talking about now because the situation was more intense and the um, uh, it's with Reverend Williamson uses the book how to be an anti-racist as a principle for their conversations my recollection I I only had a bit of that training but it had to do with with going to be the victim of assault. I mean, you were, you were literally put in a position in which people were going to be saying the way the demonstrators could expect that people would talk to them and act toward them. It was, it was, it was brutal. Uh, it was very difficult. Uh, and remember the demonstrators here in St. Augustine didn't have Dr. King did and the leaders that came down here did, not all of them were all together on board with it, but it was, it was, uh, it was a very intense training to avoid reacting in ways that normally we would. I'm wondering today if he'd expand his, um, he's definitely, a, I read the book, he's definitely uh, very oriented to Christian um, and Christianity. And I'm wondering, and he mentioned the Judeo-Christian. I wonder if today he would include all of the Abrahamic faiths and every faith has a golden rule that, you know, comparable. And that, that's interesting. I used to have a, a poster on my right. refrigerator of the various versions of the golden rule. Right. And one of the things I used to do was six is to take them and rank them in the order in which some of them require much more sacrifice and appreciation of other people than just, you know, don't do to somebody else what you don't want them to do to you. You know, if they were, uh, I'm not sure that I'm completely, I wouldn't be prepared to do exactly what you've asked, but, but we will get to the, some of those thoughts that he has along the way. Uh, at one point, he makes the point has the power and the language to be able to inspire people to do this kind of work. Um, I I, I kind of question that. I've, I've lived among highly spiritual people mm -hmm. who are able to practice. I lived for a year with uh, uh, Lakota-speaking people uh, in, in a, 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 a community in Oklahoma. And they lived this civility principle in their, in their public conversations. Um, and, and they were certainly spiritual people, but they were not necessarily drawing on the Judeo-Christian version of spirituality to, to act in that way. So I believe you have to have some spiritual underpinnings, but I, I, in my, I personally question whether it's only uh, uh, religions that, that practice it. Hugh, you had a pause point there. This, just going back to the uh, King's uh, strategy in St. Augustine, and for, the, for that matter, uh, for the so Southern Christian Leadership Conference strategy, the nonviolent strategy, I would argue the, the, the strategy of civility. <laughs> and what, what obviously, what I, think the, I think the author in our book even tells us that as he understood that strategy, King was trying to persuade, convert the people who were against what they were marching for, that indeed they had a legitimate basis for this demonstration, this nonviolent demonstration. Um, I understand how slowly those kinds of things work, but through the television, it did have tremendous, King's methods had tremendous impact 
and I would argue successful impact across the country and across the world for that matter, uh, because these, these um, TV pictures were all, and, and the, the, the second point I would make is the Black Panther movement did not take a civility path um, in their movement for equal rights. Um, uh, for uh, black Americans. I'm not arguing one over the other, although maybe at another time I, I would have a conversation, but they also had a purpose. Um, and, and what I would ask our group is, I mean, uh, we, we might say, okay, I can understand their anger and, uh, um, uh, but can we condone them killing others uh, because they have been killed? Um, and that's, 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 a, that's a rabbit hole I'm, I, I just can't go down. I was wondering what, what degree of, of security you have to have for civility? Mm. How secure do you have to feel to, to in, in, in fact, incorporate that value or, or practice it? Did you have the training, Mary Ellen? No, I, I didn't. I, I I read the book and and it just well that's not true. I was I was involved in an organization called Beyond the War and we did we did a little bit of this training, but not a lot of it. Anybody else that was involved in protesting back in the day? Did you have training on how how to non react, not react? Nobody. But you know, something that I'm thinking is, I came to that, that with the security of being a white middle-class person that didn't have a history of, of persecution. We're, I, we're in another group where, where black women are talking about post-traumatic slave disorder. And, and I'm thinking, you know, that just hit me. I, I, don't, I don't know how, I don't know how easy this is for somebody who has a very different background than I do. And that may be where the spirituality comes in. You know, maybe, you know, if you are doing, if you're doing something and you have a leader that's inspiring you to look beyond oh, fear and lack of trust, um, and you're doing it in a group and you know, they did have police protection here for part of the time, mm -hmm. but I would not probably, if I had been an African-American at the time, I, I probably would have been afraid to do it. Right. In, in terms of... Oops. You are we can hear you, George. We can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, when I retired, what I chose to do, I thought, was to learn to be a mediator. And, and I took a course from the mediation center. Uh, I think it was about 60 hours of, of training plus a practice in a real situation that the mediation center was involved with. And what was taught was very similar to the points that are in civility, the active listening, the showing of respect. Um, as a matter of fact, the textbook that we used was getting to yes, yes. Which, which is quite a classic in, in terms of using the term civility. But I, I guess I would use well, the instructor of that course had a handbook that he entitled Win-Win, which I really liked as really getting of not dominating someone else or not winning at the cost of someone else losing, but to finding a mutually acceptable resolution to the situation. I would recommend getting to yes uh, as a side 
piece. If you're if you're still in business or you're working in an organization that, you know, uh, that that has to have important conversations, getting to yes was a classic. Uh, when I was at the Ed School um, uh, in Cambridge, uh, my friends were involved with with Yuri, the guy that wrote, that was doing mediation of civil issues around the world, governmental issues, big things around the world. So it's, it's been a very effective source. Now I'd like to get to the second point that Dr. King makes. And I thought this was really inter interesting. Uh, our, our first point, of course, was the, the, uh, the, the significance that uh, civility was going to make as these and highly threatened in this situation were nevertheless going to deal with their people who were confronting them with civility. But the second point is really an interesting one. I've never heard anybody else make it. We should understand our adherence to standards of civility not only as a vital social glue, but as a letter of introduction a letter of introduction that assures strangers that linked by a shared set of practices and beliefs. Such confidence may seem to many a modern reader as a little bit quaint and perhaps naive that we live in, in, in un uncourteous, uncourteous, not in courteous, but uncourteous times, is both a truism and actually true. The notion of approaching discord with civility as a quote, letter of introduction that we are not the other, we are not a threat, we are a part of a community and, and, and we'll stay that way. And now we get to Dr. King. And yet King understood the importance the protesters carried their letters of introduction, their civility, their confirmation to those clansmen out there that they are a part of a community along with their placards and Bibles. The goal of the movement was to ensure that black Americans could become full, not to tear it apart. Hence the big difference between, and what you were saying earlier, Hugh, about the difference between the Black Panthers and, you know, and, and the, King, the King movement. Today's many dissatisfied citizens of all colors and all classes do well to remember the SCLC's example to always to carry always the letter of entry standards of civility that demonstrate respect for our fellow citizens. No matter what the cost, we should take care to bring the letter with us at, to every rally, to include it in every letter to the editor, to speak it aloud on. What is your response to this principle of civility as a letter of introduction toward people with whom we would almost certainly disagree? And how do you think Dr. King was doing that in St. Augustine? Anybody have some thoughts on that? The kids, the children. That was part of his letter of introduction when the children marched. Mm -hmm. uh, in St. Augustine. To, to me, that, that speaks volumes about uh, these people's letters of introduction and that they're willing to march with their children. And in their Sunday clothes. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and in their Sunday clothes. Wow. Their little white anklets and church shoes.
Sandra, what page is uh, the letter of introduction passage? Um, I think it's on, on, I have the start of that on page 24. Thank you. Okay, and so the second of his points, civility requires that we sacrifice for strangers, not for just the people that we know. We've already said that. But the next three the, uh, uh, points, two, three, and four, are all based on the same incident. That incident, that incident to you. So civility requires that we sacrifice for strangers, not just for people we know. Civility has two parts. This to me, this single sentence is the most powerful thing I read in this book. And it is the one that has, has challenged me the most in trying to operationalize these principles in, in, in my own dealings. Civility has two parts, generosity, even when it is costly, and trust, even when there is risk. Those children, those people in their, their, set their anklets and their Sunday shoes, the people who we, we read about were showing generosity when it was profoundly cross, could cost them their health, could cost them. One of the things that, um, that Taylor Branch brings out in the book, Parting the Waters, and, it, and Melinda, you and I may remember it from our time growing up here. If you grow up in the South, you, you would know this to be true. What separated black people uh, who were respected by whites and black people who were not respected by whites was. I'm Jay sorry. Would you repeat that? Uh, that was the please. very last of the sentence. What separated them was 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 what was, what? was going to jail when when Rosa Parks, who was an, an upstanding uh, middle class woman, uh, who was the uh, was it, it was the youth group. Uh, chairman of the NAACP, who was very well respected even among whites and blacks, went to jail. That was the one experience that separated, I'm going to say this because Taylor Branch says it this way, rose from the niggers in both white and black society was whether or not you were upstanding and upstanding meant you never went to jail. Dr. King had to write the letter from the Birmingham jail because his fellow preachers were going to call seriously into question that a minister of the church who was middle-class and respected was ended up going, going to jail. Uh, and so, people here in St. Augustine that knew full well that they were going to end up that generous act of being willing to do that for this principle was profoundly costly and God knows they were trusting people like Halstead Manusi and people worse than him to uh, not to kill them. They knew that they're, they, they understood full well, full well the risk that they were under. The, uh, and of course, the, the fourth point that he makes, that civility creates not merely a negative duty to do no harm, but an affirmative duty to do good. So keep these three principles in mind as you hear this story, because uh, this was so meaningful to Carter uh, that he Again, civility requires that we sacrifice for strangers, not just people we know, that it calls upon us to be generous even when it is costly and trust even when there is risk, and that we have a, not only, civility requires not only the negative duty not to harm, but also the affirmative duty to do it. Okay, when uh, the family was first living in Washington, D.C., they were living on the south side of the district in a largely African-American neighborhood. And the kids, uh, and um, uh, Carter was about six years old or about that, uh, about the time this happened. They would tell fantastical stories about Virginia, you know, 
and Robert E. Lee and slavery and, and white people and how scary they were and, and because they, and they were living in this little enclave. But as his father became the president of the Urban League, the father moved them into an all white neighborhood. And this kid was more than fearful about neighborhood where there was nobody else like him. And as the family drew, drove up and get, got out of the car and the, the boy sat down on the steps and a woman next door named Sarah Kestenbaum, Sarah Kestenbaum's special contribution to civilian back in 1966 was to create for us a sense of belonging where none existed before. She, and she did so, even though she had never seen any of us in her life, she managed in the course of a single day to turn us from strangers into friends, a remarkable gift that few can share. What we must never, what we must never require friendship as a price of civility. So basically what she did, house, you know, and the neighbors were watching these black folks moving into their neighborhood. Sarah Kastenbaum called out to them, welcome, and went over to them and started talking with them. And then she went into the house and got cream cheese and jelly sandwiches and brought them out to these traumatized little children that were sitting on the front porch among these alien people who, who had, uh, who even at that age he knew were, were not going to be welcoming to them. The story illustrates what I mean when I say that civility is the set of sacrifices we for our fellow passengers. Sarah Katzenbaum was generous to us, giving of herself with no benefit to herself. a trust that we were people to whom one could be and should be generous. Think about that, that scene, that scenario, when her neighbors were surely gonna criticize her. The neighbors were fearful of those others that were moving into those neighborhoods. And this family was was justifiably fearful of the others about whom they were about to be surrounded. And yet she did this thing. To show this number, uh, number four, civility creates not merely the negative duty not to do harm, but the affirmative. There was Sarah, not just saying no to issues, but doing the affirmative, doing the good thing when she didn't need to. In the Jewish tradition, this duty is captured in the requirement of chesed, C-H-E-S-E-D, for those of you that don't have the book, and that is the act of, the doing of acts of kindness, which in turn derived from the understanding that human beings are made in the image of God this understanding imposes a duty to do as God would do. A member of the, um, uh, the Science of Mind Church here, the minister, Jewel say, she would say this often, when the phone rings, it's God calling and God answering. So for God's sake, let's try to be godly about it. <laughs> so I think I think that's what he's saying to us. <laughs> Perhaps this Sarah Kestenbaum, our welcoming neighbor back in 1966, whose family was deeply religious. Civility itself may be seen as a part of Chesed. It does indeed require con kindness toward our fellow citizens including the one who are strangers, and even when it is hard. When we are polite rather than rude, 
warm rather than cold, when we try to see God in others, we are doing acts of kindness. In all these acts, we welcome the stranger, not because of any benefit we think will come to us, but because we come to believe that welcoming the stranger is right. Remember what we have observed about desire. Civility often demands its discipline. What civility may counsel, we are not always free. We are always free not to be kind to one another. Probably wrong to exercise that freedom. There was, now, a very long, there was a really long pause there, Sandra. All right, I'll read it again. Um, I'm going to take a... Uh, did, did you hear the remember what we have observed part? Yes. Okay, part, Re okay. remember what we have re observed about desire. Civility often demands its discipline. No matter what civility might counsel, we are always free not to be kind. We are not to be kind to each other. But it is almost always more to exercise that freedom. It is always more morally wrong in other okay. words yeah yeah you can you you can you can exercise your your right i'm, I'm going to say this i hope i'm not putting words in i know I'm words in his mouth i know that but uh but for sandra speaking yes we are all free not to wear a mask we're free to do that it's always morally wrong to exercise that freedom. I think he would agree to that. What he would not agree to is a mask mandate. And hmm. he talks about that uh, uh, And the next sentence. I speak, of course, of self-restraint and not restraint through law. Hmm. Okay, there's a lot there. Yeah. And sacrificing for strangers and not just the people we know and being generous when it is costly and trusting when it is risky and not just not doing harm but the mandate to do good um, yes but by that logic then would he have been opposed to the civil rights act of 1964 and 65 i remember back in the uh you know, dating myself, I remember Barry Goldwater saying, well, you can't legislate morality yes. when he was against the uh, civil rights movement. So by that, if he can't legislate it, then would he have been against the civil rights movement? And if so, how would we have come full circle, if you will, or how, how would we ever gotten back to justice? Uh, if we decide to send our questions to David Carter I'd like to put that on the list because uh, it, in in the 1960s uh, let's see Nell you were here Melinda you were here there was a restaurant on you on Dixie Highway called Pappy's and they refused to sell anybody in interstate travel because it was only because of interstate travel that the Public Accommodations Act was, quote, justifiable, constitutional, whatever you want to say. Uh, so, yeah, there were uh, that would say you can't legislate, uh, you can't legislate uh, uh, tolerance. You can't, what was the word that uh, what Goldwater used? You can't morality. Morality. Um, uh, and, and I remember at least my response to that at the time was, you know, you can't legislate you can legislate the kind of harm that other people can do to one another. And that may not, uh, may not have a, some folks are being beat up upon and misused, but Melinda, you. 
Well, I, I, what Tom just said was something that I was had been thinking about saying, and it's well, there are several things. First of all, in how to be an anti-racist, and maybe it was also the color of law. I'm trying. The books are sort of running together that I've read in the last few months, but the the main point in I think it was how to be an anti-racist is we have to turn this into policy. We can't, we, we can have all the good intentions we want, but unless there are policies that are put into place, you know, by the government, then things are not going to change. And it's a kind of chicken and egg thing, but once, once the, for example, once the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Acts were passed, then people began over time to accept that. That's right. That that was normal and that was the, that it would have been immoral not to let a person whose skin color was dark to, into a, a hotel or a restaurant. It doesn't change everyone's hearts, but it does begin to change the way society thinks uh, it, as a, a whole and, and thinks is what society thinks is moral sometimes the policy precedes what the heart feels. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think that, that he has a point in saying that it's not, you know, Matt, we shouldn't mandate masks, but everybody should have the, 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 should do the moral thing and wear them for the other person. But that's a little bit idealistic. Um, I personally would like to see a mask mandate <laughs> because yeah, I, would like, I would like to put on our list to him. Does public health right. trump the um, uh, hit, does, did, does public health make a difference? Yeah, um, yeah, because there are there are a lot of examples like smoking on an airplane or or um, we. I mean, there are. Lots, I mean, we need we need laws. We need regulations. The question is how much is, you know, how many are too many? Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was in regard to, to being kind to strangers and civil to strangers as well as, as those we love or who, whom we're close to, I think it's a lot easier to be civil towards strangers often. I think it costs us less. There's, it's, there's less risk involved in when, let's say, some telemarketer calls up and, and you're really friendly and, and kind and saying, well, you know, thank you very much. I, I'm not interested, but being civil uh, or to someone in, in a store or uh, somebody you don't really know walking down the street. It's much more difficult when we're close to someone whom we do love, but we disagree viscerally with. And so I think that's the greater <laughs> challenge, maybe because the risk is so much greater. Hmm. Because we don't want to lose their love, that we don't want to lose that relationship. Yeah. I, I want to point out that we're coming up to 1210. Yeah. We're losing people. So Sandra, I don't know how you want to handle this. Um, First of all, we have a, a we have a hand up. Oh, yeah. there we go. I, I find it strange that no one has actually mentioned the word education. Um, I think uh, civility is hugely a matter of education from our mother's knee onwards. And we're going to have a reliance on all of the institutions, education, church, and family. Yes, all of that. Yeah. In terms of responsibility. All of that. All of that. But when you're talking about education, are you talking about our public education? Or are you talking about our families? Those are our three primary institutions. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about all of the occasions when uh, knowledge is imparted to the young who then continue to build on that knowledge throughout their lives and start educating others in their turn. And I think the failure in many cases, the lack of civility 
is a lack of education if you examine things a little deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, Whose could, responsibility is that? Yeah, indeed. One, one could go on and on and on about this subject, but uh, I think education also is a question of stability in, in, uh, in a society. And uh, he, he brings up an example of a, oh, never mind. Yeah, I've got to go too. He brings up the example yeah. of uh, corporal punishment with children, which I thought was a really interesting discussion. Who gets to say that you can't spank your, your child or, you know, swat his behind and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and the way he went into it, how cultures vary, change, uh, are different and understanding of what's corporal or what's abuse, um, you know, it was pretty interesting. Now, I just want to make a comment based on what Ivan had said, having lived in Europe and getting to know a number of Brits, I think the education in the, with, within England, within Great Britain, is very different and it is much more civil than in America. In America, where they're like, oh, well, you know, we can do as we please, we want to do whatever, they, we are less likely to be um, respectful in, in terms of other people because it's all about me, 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 which is, I think, very different than what you have in the, in the, British, in the British culture or even the European culture. One little more thought before we, we go, and that is that I feel that uh, civility has a great deal to do with the number of people living in a relatively confined space. If you look at Japan, Japan is full of rules and regulations about how you behave. The same thing happens in lots of small countries. In large countries where there is plenty of space, there is lots of competition, uh, people tend to be if you like, less civil, um, because it is all about competition in its uh, rudest uh, uh, guise. Because if you don't uh, fight your corner, no one is going to fight it for you. Uh, so I would say that if you examine the civilizations uh, of the world, space does create uh, a more rough hewn character. Look at Australia. I mean, all the Aussies are, uh, maybe they were Brits once, but they certainly aren't anymore. Uh, has a lot to do with the space which they have. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Where we'll take up next week at, at number five. Uh, I would really uh, uh, encourage you just uh, for your, your own uh, own work, work, uh, pondering to write down anything that you found interesting about this morning. If there's anything you want to email to me, uh, and uh, you know, I I really hope that this this is is meaningful for you. Uh, coming on the heels of of our work with uh, if it takes all summer, I think it 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 throws our understanding principles in a whole new light. I also have an extra ticket to the Martin Luther King breakfast. They only would allow, you know, if you got a ticket, you had to get two. Uh, the one, I, I only need mine. So if you'd like to go and don't have a ticket, please, please let me know. Uh, we may be joined next week by, uh, by Ann Summers. Uh, Colonel Summers is a, a teacher at the War College in Washington, D.C., uh, she was deployed to both Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Kuwait, and Korea. And civility is on her chain of commands required reading. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Interesting. So, so Anne, oh. that the War College requires its staff and its students to read civility. So Anne may be joining us. She was traveling back to DC today, so she couldn't join us. So thank you all for your comments. And uh, again, if you want to to uh, uh, email me, you know, please do. Please do. Thank, sure. you. thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Sandra, so thank you. You. Happy to hear. Take care of yourselves. Thanks. One quick question: We're, We have we don't know when to start the next book, and it the, it.
Depends on what y'all want to do for Martin Luther King, um, the Martin Luther King holiday on that Monday. So let's just ask if those who are here, would you would you like to take that day off so you can uh, attend either virtually or in person or both the Martin Luther King celebration in St. Augustine or should we just move forward with starting the next book on the 18th? What, so do you want to do something else on Martin Luther King? Raise your hand if you'd like to do something else. Well, wait a minute. We, we're, we're planning to go to Martin Luther King, so that makes it tricky to get back for 11, doesn't it? I don't think you would be able to do that. Yeah, I, I would like virtually to attend. Okay, so let's just say we're not going to meet on the 18th. Okay. okay. That's, that's good, because we're a racial justice group. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to throw it out there. <laughs> it's only right. I, I think. I think so. All right. So we've got that decision made. Sandra, thank you very much. Thank and uh, I hope people are in touch with you. I, I'd like to write. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. See you next time. Thanks.